Hello, my name is Elena Benedicto and I work at uh, Purdue University in the Indigenous and Endangered Languages Lab. And before I, and my pronouns are she and her. And before I begin this presentation, I want to respectfully acknowledge the sovereignty of the land and the people of Hawaii where uh, this conference is being hosted. And I want to extend that respect to any uh, individuals, any groups of First Nations, uh, Native or Indigenous uh, peoples that may be joining us today. I also want to thank the organizers of the conference for putting this together in a very unusual year uh, under very unusual circumstances and for supporting us in doing this. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, I'm going to begin my presentation. Uh, the presentation is about resisting relationship building, why we keep avoiding the obvious. Uh, I'm going to um, see. I'm going to organize my talk in these five points. First, I'm going to set the issue. I'm going to establish my point, and I'm going to illustrate it uh, with uh, two points. First, one about the money, and a second one about property. Uh, and I'm going to conclude uh, stopping to think about it um, and how we can move forward. So uh, the theme of this year's conference uh, was that despite um, our best efforts, many of the attempts at addressing language loss and endangerment have fallen short. And so the question is, why are we not more successful? Uh, one potential reason uh, was that building and fostering relationship between all different stakeholders uh, has not been maximized. Uh, my, the, the point that I'm, I'm using as a point of departure today is if we've known this all along, why do we keep on making the same mistakes, quote unquote? Why do we keep stumbling over the same stone over and over again? And, and then um, the follow-up question is, are they really mistakes at all? And uh, what could be the source of all those mistakes? Or mistakes may be a strong word, but not getting to where we want to get. So before we get to that, I want to pause for a bit and bring uh, a, to the fore a paper by uh, Ken Hale and, and others. Uh, that appeared in language in 1992. And I want to bring it because that paper was considered the beginning in a way of um, everything, of, of the field actually waking up to the loss of, uh, the extreme loss of languages that was happening. In that paper, two points are identified. One is uh, the consequences of language loss for the science of language. And another one is the consequences of the loss of culture and intellectual non-tangible worth for the speaking communities. Uh, at the, the responsibilities are also identified at the macro level, at the big level. Uh, in the, uh, at the beginning of the paper, it is uh, said that that language loss is part of a larger process in which politically dominant languages and cultures, and that's my under my highlight, uh, simply overwhelm indigenous local languages and cultures, placing them in a condition which can only be described as embattled. And that I think is a very strong statement. Uh, by the end of the paper, it concludes that the destruction of this intellectual treasure, um, he's talking about, the author is talking about uh, a particular uh, language, was carried out for the most part by people who were not aware of its existence, coming as they did from a culture in which wealth and physical, wealth is physical and visible. And I want to also highlight that second point. The paper also uh, identify what is what can be considered good and what could definitely be better. Uh, 
Well, it is good and commendable to record and document, and in some cases this is absolutely necessary to avert total loss of cultural wealth. The greater goal must be that of safeguarding diversity in the world of the people. And again, those are my highlights and my italics. Uh, and we are going to get around these issues throughout the presentation and by the end. The point of this paper is that such failure, that is the failure to build an alternative model of relationship building, is not coincidental and that there are systemic ideological forces in professional linguistics that have resisted the implementation of new models of interaction, models of relation building at the structural level. So I want to make um, sure that uh, I emphasize that I'm talking about structural forces and not about individuals. Uh, that such systemic forces are fashioned in the same way as the systemic structural racism that has been recently brought to the fore worldwide. And uh, that those forces are the continuation of our colonial systems. I'm going to argue that in professional linguistics, the second point in Hale and Al in 1992 has uh, been willfully ignored with initiatives concentrated on the first point. And uh, those are the two points. The, the second point, the consequences for the loss of cultural, intellectual and non-tangible worth for the speaking communities has been willfully ignored. The contribution of community members, the locus of the relationship building is relegated as a way to improve the quality and quantity of data collection for linguistic purposes. And one, throughout the years, one can see these things actually specifically using this language stated in that way. But it's not pointed out as a matter of linguistic rights or to improve the language vitality. Uh, and there I want to, rem to remember, to remind again uh, that previous uh, citation in which the greater goal must be that of safeguarding diversity in the world of people. So I take this to be the continuation of the old colonial ways and cultural ideologies that only see, as the uh, Hallett Old paper was saying, the physical and visible wealth. And language is not, language and culture are not. So in order to uh, address these issues, these points, I'm going to talk about two cases. I'm going to um, select two cases to talk about it. One is related to money. And I'm going to talk about the new version of the DEL or uh, the DEL or DLI uh, program. And the second one has to do with property. And for that, I'm going to talk about definitions of ownership of data at university, at universities in our Western uh, academic world. So first, first came the money. Uh, so the newly reinvented uh, Dell program is interesting because, and I want to talk about that because is uh, the, the program who was heralded or was hailed as one of the outputs, as one of the very important outputs out of the, um, the hailing all paper, language paper. So it, it seemed to be the, uh, the, the result of people actually paying attention and putting money where their words were. Um, it's still funded by NSF and NEH, but it has been revised and reformulated. And uh, the, the name of the program is interesting in itself because it went from documenting endangered languages, so the notion of endangered was in there, to dynamic language infrastructure, so with a a uh, sharpened focus on technology, computational infrastructure and methods uh, that are directly and uh, directed mostly to white, to mostly white Western professional linguists. Um, and that uh, purposefully uh, excludes revitalization efforts. Uh, I don't want, uh, I'm, I'm, this, this documentation is uh, readily available in the web and I don't want to do a textual analysis of, about it, but um, one could in a longer version of this as a paper actually 
analyze the actual uh, wording that the program description uses now. Um, so those revitalization efforts are uh, purposefully excluded, which are directed to the non-white language community. The text itself is ambivalent about the worth of the revitalization enterprise. So it recognizes the, important of, the importance of languages and the cultures that are associated, uh, but not enough to be paying for it. Uh, and so it uh, redirects uh, people interested in that to other sources of appropriate funding um, uh, for the purposes of um, for the purposes of revitalization for US-based language communities. Um, but there are several elephants in the room that are not still addressed. So the performance of the Dell program in the past, uh, in the corridors of several conferences, um, we were hearing that uh, it was important to, incre to increase the participation in that program to show that it was still a relevant and interesting program. But um, I, I couldn't hear, I didn't, or I didn't hear any um, relevant conversation about why, uh, why there were not more uh, uh, proposals for that program. And I was wondering if anybody was reporting on responses or uh, hearing or listening on the responses from language communities, because many of them, of the ones that I heard, were uh, along the lines of uh, what Bach talks in his paper, uh, published in 95, but going back to 92 too, uh, a response from an elder of a community that he was working with, what's in it for me, what's in it for us? Why, why do we have to care about the linguistic work that you are doing? Um, and in particular, well, I'll stop there. And also, how about those language communities uh, that are outside the borders of the US and for which these other sources of appropriate funding that I was mentioning here were not appropriate? Uh, I'm going to. Um, argue later that there are many language communities that have suffered from colo the colonial um, actions of our communities, of our society nowadays. So the fact that they are not in within the territorial US uh, doesn't mean that um, actions from the past have not affected them. So uh, some things to consider uh, in this discussion, and these are things that people have brought to my attention, is the claim that the funds are taxpayer monies and that thus they need to be useful for US taxpayers and restricted to science purposes, which is the domain of NSF and not NEH. But NSF is willing to pay um, extraordinary amounts of money as overhead to US or Western-like institution to the point between 56 and 60% of the budget. Uh, if we think that, um, that um, um, an average, um, I don't know if an average, but a norm, um, um, an amount of money that uh, can be funded on this program can be around 400 or 450,000 that means that an institution can take between $250,000 and $280,000 just for the sake of being uh, an institution. And those funds are not directly related to the science part of the project, um, even though they are claimed to be paying for electricity and things like that. Uh, if anybody's interested in knowing more about that, I can I can tell you what I did not get when I was having funding like that from my institution. Uh, and it is also interesting because the program description talks about the world's endangered languages, but uh, apparently none of that can be spent uh, beyond the territorial US. So it's money, but it also it's an ideology system that decides where 
that money is well spent and where it is not, where it's worth spending the money on and what not. So like-minded Western or Western-like institutions are okay. We can spend money, even if it is not related to the science of the project itself, we can spend money on them. But community groups uh, and interests are not worthy of spending money on. And, um, and it is interesting because the money tells you priorities, right? In an indirect way, but it tells you where the priorities are, what is important and what is not. So is this a unique, uh, a unique problem to the US? No, I don't think so. Uh, other non-US funding institutions follow the same model and the same priorities. And I have uh, written about that in a paper uh, from 2018 in the volume, the very nice volume that uh, Bishan Fred Jani uh, uh, edited. The second uh, area where I want to um, talk about is the property. First the money, then the property, uh, the ownership of linguistic data. So it turns out that data gathered as part of your work as a researcher or your students uh, in a university program stays the property of the university, that is the Western mostly white institution. And that is so even if the student collected it from his or her family, in the case that the student is a, uh, a student from a language community or from the their language community. Even if the data originated from the same people that would like a copy. So I'm giving you data from my community and now that data does not belong to me, it belongs to you. Uh, if you collaborate with another institution or community group and they collect data with you in their community, then special provisions and permissions need to be requested from the US institution to share those data with the community where those data originated. So think about it. Um, the data come from a community. That community share it with us linguists, outsiders. And now they have to ask for permission from our institution to actually get it back. Very interesting. And uh, anybody wants to know more details, I can also provide them. So again, even if if it was originally stated that a copy would remain with them, you still need to make those, to request those permissions. So what's the problem? After all, um, the data were collected, one could argue that the data were collected either with money from the institution, maybe you got a grant, or while the researcher was affiliated with, it is uh, receiving money from the institution. Uh, so it's only fair that the institution protects its assets, its investments. Uh, and so the question for me at least um, remains, does affiliation or money determine property use benefit then? Is money really what trumps everything else? So I wanted to bring uh, about uh, something that um, I learned or Year, many years ago when I was beginning to do city training uh, on the ethics of research with human subjects. Um, there is a principle that is very in interesting and it states that specific populations, uh, for instance, prisoners or people of color cannot be used for the benefit of another distinct population, for instance, white suburbia inhabitants, right? And so that goes back to the origins of um, uh, these ethic commissions and the abuses that happened uh, in the name of science. So why is it different or is it different in linguistics? In linguistics, we think about it. We are using language data from a specific group, minority, mostly non-white populations for the benefit of institutional science, which is, uh, which is uh, white. It's white and belongs to the dominant uh, portion of the population. So is it really different? I don't think so. So money and property, those are two tenets of the social system where we live and work, basically, if you want to call it capitalism, uh, of an ideology that drives who has or who has not, who owns or who does not. Just on the basis, just as on the basis of the racial racial protests we saw 
uh, in 2020 and beyond. It's a very interesting. Um, so it's money, but it's also an ideology system that decides where money is well spent and where not. So again, like-minded Western or Western-like institutions are okay, but institutions that are usually, which are institutions that are usually associated with the dominant population. Remember that quote from the beginning from the Hale et al. paper. Uh, and so if we circle back, we get to it, right? Remember that quote? Uh, language laws was a large part of a larger process in which politically dominant languages and cultures which are now reflected in those institutions, um, sorry, in those institutions that are uh, managing our funds and are keeping the property of our data. Uh, so they are the inheritors of these political dominant languages and cultures that simply overwhelm indigenous local cultures and languages, placing them in a condition which can only be described as embattled. Uh, so again, the circle goes back. So instead of mending the effects of old colonial processes and models, our institutions continue that same model, adapting it to the times. Individually, we, as we can be a we, uh, as conscientious members of, of a field, we may seem to have engaged in new models of relationship building collaborative research. However, structurally, we are still embedded in acting within the same systemic structures of power that created the demise of the very same languages that we are engrossed in working for. And when uh, I'm saying working for, I'm, I'm saying, um, referring to documenting, recording, analyzing. And so again, I circle back to uh, the Haletal paper when it says that, well, it's good and sometimes commendable to record and document. The greater goal uh, for us should be that of safeguarding diversity in the world of people, that is the language communities. We seem thus more engaged in taking pictures of the golden eggs rather than on keeping the golden goose alive and excuse the metaphor. Is it impossible? Is it impossible to build another model of interaction? Uh, no, and I always like to bring up the, the Canada case and it's not that um, it's um, a golden model, uh, but they engaged in the, in, in the conversation and they changed things. So uh, if you want to know about that, there are some references there and they involve the uh, equivalent, their equivalent of the NSF in very hard conversations that unfortunately we here in the US have not even begun to have. So move, moving forward, wh where can we go from here? Is this a, a, a lost battle? I don't think so. If our neighbors to the north begin to engage in a conversation, maybe we can too. Uh, it, it, it would require leadership in the field. Um, it would require shaking the very deep underlying principles on which our society is based. It would require a conversation between funding agencies, university structures, professional organizations, both the LSA and all the other SILA, the other SILA and those individuals already engaged in creating those models, most of which are already in those professional organizations. Uh, it would require a willingness to change the mindset and to share power, which is very difficult, uh, and to reconsider the role of the speakers of the dominant language as an integral part of the task that we are doing. The task being not only to describe, document, record the languages, but also participate in maintaining the language. As someone uh, that saw a movie about linguists once told me, um, very shaken by what uh, she was seeing, uh, was they, they, they seem to want to record the old uh, people but they are not taking care of them. So it would be equivalent to have um, research on diabetes and 
preclude um, the use of resources to create um, medical attention for people with diabetes. Um, that person was an indigenous person and was very shaken by what she was saying. So it would require stopping the source of ideology systems that is at the, um, at the source of most language loss. So wrapping up, um, I will reiterate the points that I, I began with. The film's failure of creating meaningful and collaborative relationships between the community and other forces and other uh, members, other stakeholders, is not coincidental. It's the outcome of a systemic ideological power structure in linguistics that mimic uh, the social structures where we are embedded, which are old. Uh, that have resisted the implementation, the true implementation of true new models of interactions, models that build true reciprocal equal relationships. That such systemic forces are fashioned in the same way as the systemic structural racism that has been brought to the fore recently in the US, but also around the world, uh, which are the continuation of all colonial systems. Moving forward is possible, but it's a hard road ahead of us. Uh, but it only requires us to begin that conversation, to really begin to talk seriously about it. So here are some references. Um, questions are welcome, mahalo, uh, and thanks. And I'm going to stop sharing and to end this recording.